one saying we are Christ-centered. We are spirit-formed, we are, we are Bible-based, we are Sabbath-celebrating, we are distinct but inclusive. We are compassionate and worship, uh, passionate and worship, compassionate and service. We are, etc., united in fellowship. This is who we are. This is what our lives are. And um, today I want to take a moment and talk about the one that says distinct yet inclusive. What does that mean? What it is to live distinctly but to be inclusive. How does that play out in our various lives and what it does? Because one of the things that we, as a part of the body of Christ, is distinct, the obvious one, is that we are Sabbath celebrating. From Friday night to Saturday night, in the manner of the way that Jesus and his apostles did, we rest on the Sabbath. Mirroring what happened at creation, disregarding what Constantine did to change it to Sunday, and benefiting from the... And so there, therefore we are called the Church of God Seventh Day. Now, as we look back over the 160, 170 odd years where we've been to where Jesus Christ is leading us now, we look at the distinctives that have formed us and the primary number one pillar that we are, number one, is that we are Christ-centred. Number one, that's the biggest pillar Jesus is Lord, head of the church. He died for you and me. We have access to the Father through Jesus Christ. And so the number one pillar is that Jesus is Lord. And Apostle Paul says he counts everything else as rubbish that he may gain Christ. And I read that many years ago and tie it in together where Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Then this is the body of Christ. So some people looking at our journey may say to us, well, which is greater, Christ or the Sabbath? Because some people think you worship the Sabbath. No, we worship on the Sabbath, but we don't worship the Sabbath. Of course, we know that Scripture says where Jesus said he is the Lord of the Sabbath. So we could be called the Church of Christ Seventh Day. What it does, it raises questions as to identity and purpose in this world. Hence we have a 10-point vision statement. And the International Ministerial Congress works very actively to share that 10-point vision statement. We reflect Christ because of the saving grace that's been given to us, not to earn our salvation, but we reflect the righteousness that comes from listening to what Jesus calls us to. And so we find great rest. While the world is busy in its relentless pursuit of materialism, we find time to pause and to rest and be and not only is it the fourth of commandment it accidentally happens to be the fourth statement here see we see a world that's largely lost it in the sense that we are always geared to working harder faster sparse faster more efficiently greater productivity and we're almost back to where the ancient israelites were in a m constant cycle of making bricks make more bricks make more bricks now you've got to get your own straw and we find ourselves with what they call either the iron cage or the golden handcuffs geared to a society that says oh, if you're going to rest you better play sport or you better be actively engaged. None of the level of there is a God who made everything, who rested on the Sabbath, and Jesus Christ is our ultimate rest. So to a world that's lost its way, Jesus also says, I will draw all men to myself. So here we are as brothers and sisters following Jesus Christ. The world does not know Jesus, but Jesus says, I will draw all men to myself. And we cherish that we are pioneers of that grace given to us as pioneers of all mankind that will follow. That's kind of powerful. Think of where you are today, because Christ has already drawn you to himself. Because he's going to draw all men to himself. Scripture says one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess. That's very powerful. So to live distinctly, apart from the world. See, what the challenge is, is that if you look... At, at Orthodox Christianity, so much of pagan influence has affected the body of Christ. And when you look at, for example, mainstream Protestantism, you'll see that they take their teachings from tradition and from the Bible. Catholicism adds one more to that. They take it from the Pope, from tradition and the Bible. 
The body of Christ, especially among the Sabbatarian community, says the Bible and the Bible alone. Now, that's also to note that even within the Sabbatarian community, you have parts of the body of Christ who have a prophetess in their story. You have, I came from one Sabbatarian church that had an apostle in its story. I knew more about the apostle than I did Jesus Christ. So I have a particular understanding of this particular journey. And, but I also know that we are called to live counter-culturally. To focus, live distinctly on Jesus, focusing on Jesus Christ, having access to the Father, but living counter-culturally, pausing from the rush of life, openly profaning Jesus' name, comes with a price. And it's not a price sugar-coated Christianity is prepared to bear. Being distinct yet inclusive also means that our journey is one of suffering with Christ. There's a cost of discipleship in exalting and upholding the name of Jesus, in doing His work, in doing His will, and living distinctly. When Jesus said in Matthew 10, pick up your cross and follow me, it reminds us of the Jesus they killed. They labelled him as a blasphemer. This is the Son of God, and as well as demon-possessed. That was the religious authorities of the day. And pick up your cross and follow me, as I mentioned earlier, reminds me of the Jesus facing a jeering crowd. He would have faced the jeering crowd. So if I bring some scriptures to mind, John 15, 20, Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. Why? For living distinctly. Outside of the world, outside the world's traditions. Matthew 10, 22, you will be hated, said Jesus. And the question I ask, why? For living holy. Because when we live holy, we expose their moral bankruptcy. Very powerful. Matthew 24, 9, you will be hated for, by all nations. Why? For my name's sake. Why? For speaking Jesus' words. I have no words of my own. So when we speak Jesus' words on the definition of, of marriage, ouch, that goes against society. When we speak about sexuality or the right of unborn children, I pray for those children every day. And I say, God, how long before another 3,000 children are killed, another 30,000 children are killed? Jesus knew the challenge that we would have on this earth and he was already prepared. We know in the Lord's Prayer, he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And some translations render evil as the evil one. It's applicable in both ways, depending how you read it. Um, in John 17, a couple of weeks ago, we covered where Jesus says, I pray that you not take them out of the world, but that you'd keep them from the evil one. So we have Jesus, our advocate and high priest, interceding for you and me today, we're in the world, we love to be like Abraham who's looked for a city and builder and maker as God, living in tents as a sojourner, we're sojourning on this earth temporarily, but Jesus prayed for us. He's our advocate and he says, keep them from the evil one. And I'm glad that we have this divine safekeeping. Many years ago, I had a traffic accident and I had a strong premonition before the traffic accident that that's what would occur. It was a thought that occurred in my mind. Bang! Terrible collision and terrible injury. Then one day I was ready to head off somewhere and I felt the same thought in my head. And before I drove, I stopped and prayed until the feeling went. And I'm glad for God's divine protection. I ignored the, the thought that came to me and bang! A horrific car accident. And next time that feeling came, I know by the throne of grace we have that divine protection. And I, I pray for my, my family's way every day. I look like beautiful grandchildren. You know, this time next year we'll have seven grandchildren. That changes your prayer life. You really care for those God has given you. You know, despite living in this world, we know that we are pioneers of the faith. And we know that ultimately all men will be drawn to Jesus. So no matter what we see in greater secularization and the rise of Islam, no, the kingdom of God is coming. 
We hold that one day, in Philippians 2, 10, one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. This is echoed in the book of Isaiah. It's also echoed in the book of Romans. And this is the work of our Heavenly Father and we're privileged to have a part of it. We have a responsibility as a result of this kind of calling to live distinctly and uniquely, to step up, because we're not here called to warm a seat. We are part of the body of Christ. Scripture refers to us as a peculiar people, a chosen people, a, a, a special people, loved by God. And we are called in our responsibility to be welcoming. Scripture, Jesus says, love your enemies, do good to those who persecute you, pray for those who malign you, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. And so we can begin to be like living so counterculturally that when someone says a bad thing and they're in a rotten attitude, they don't see that replicated in us because of God's Spirit on us. You know, we are to reflect the holiness of Jesus Christ in a broken and divided world and yet never, ever compromise Christ, His truth and His holiness. To live holy, to be holy. Um, when Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me, there's another side of it. It's, to, it's an invitation to track a journey, a sure journey, on an unfamiliar path. A sure journey that's got a guaranteed outcome on an unfamiliar path. Because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know what the 10 years, Rebecca and I are 30 years married, and we said, what's going to happen in the next 5 or 10 years? And we look at each other with big eyes and say, I don't know what's going to happen at that time. That's in the Lord's hands. The Jesus who, who is Lord of the Sabbath, the Jesus who said that the Sabbath was made for man, all of mankind, is the same Jesus that's going to draw all men to himself. And so we are in a unique situation. We're in a unique position to reflect the glory of God, not only to the world, not only to the greater Christian community, but also within the Sabbatarian community, because there are parts of the Seventh-day a Sabbatarian community that are very law centric that you earn your salvation by commandment keeping our commandment keeping is a response to the salvation given to us we don't keep the commandments so we can tick boxes in heaven and earn our salvation, no we respond to the commandments of God and the commandments of Jesus as a result of being saved of the grace given to us because in our midst we will always exalt Jesus Christ the sad reality is that in the Australian census, in 2016, 73% of Australians associated with themselves with being Christian. Would we say they would be nominal Christians? Probably, because we don't see 73% of Australians associated actively involved in church life. By God's grace, we are privileged in a unique position to be about His will and to reflect his glory, but it comes with responsibility and it comes with a, an, an urgency in our heart when we get up every morning. See, we find ourselves every Sabbath gathering together for worship. And one of the things that we do is we don't have prophets, we don't have prophetesses, we don't have cult leaders, we have only Jesus Christ and we believe in the Bible and the Bible alone is the authoritative word of God in all matters of practice and faith. And all our hopes and all our dreams come out of that. And this is who we are and this is how we live. And, and from the fellowship and the love that we have becomes the mechanism, Jesus said, by this all men shall know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So how do people know that we are disciples of Jesus? Well, we might be able to quote scripture. No, that's not it. We might be able to quote all of Jesus' words. No, that's not it. By the love we have for one another. Godly love, sacrificial love, caring love. And this is something the world desperately needs. The world has lost love when a woman is pregnant with a child, one of her options is abortion. Where's the love? Where's the men? Our society is truly broken and it's truly sad. And um, Yet the uniqueness is where Scripture says where two or three, Jesus says where two or three, now there's more than two or three here today, are gathered in my name. We pray in Jesus' name, we live in Jesus' name, everything we do in Jesus' name for the Father's glory. Christ is among us. That makes this gathering here very, very special, very, very powerful. It makes us unique. 
it makes us distinct. So as we explore what it is to be distinct, we are distinct in Jesus Christ. That also gives us a responsibility to hear what Jesus says and do what he calls us to do because there's an urgency for us to be responsible, to stand with Jesus, to experience his suffering. John wrote in um, 1 John 4.4, 4, he was an older man then, and he was encouraging the church. And he says, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The, the personal presence of God, the Holy Spirit in us, is greater than he who is in the world. So who's the most powerful in the world to be able to do? We face opposition, we face challenges. We must never be afraid. I take great encouragement of that because that reality is very enabling. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't waste my time. The victory is ours in Christ. And it speaks the heart of God for us and ultimately all people as Jesus will draw all men to himself. So where is our identity? Our identity is in Jesus Christ. Where is our strength? It comes from Jesus Christ. Where does our mission, our purpose and our core message come from? The Word of God. And in Christ, we proclaim who our Heavenly Father is. And this identifies us as a church. It gives us this distinctiveness. And we see Jesus as Lord, as King, as High Priest, as our Advocate, exalted now and forever. And that message is that Jesus part of the reconciling work. I think last week we talked about reconciliation. And this is a continuation of that message. And yet, not everybody understands the Lordship of Christ. I grew up for the first half of my Christian life not understanding that. I didn't. I understood the Bible. I was like the Pharisees in John 5, 37, diligently searching the Scriptures that in them I might find eternal life. And Jesus says, These are they that speak of me. And he said to the Pharisees, You refuse to come to me that you may have life. And I read that and I thought, That was me. Well, Jesus, I didn't know you. It's made me very grateful because Apostle Paul searched the Scriptures all his life that he might find righteousness. And he finally met Jesus on the road to Damascus. God allows us to experience certain things in our life. Nothing's lost. Even our wandering in the wilderness. It's very encouraging. Because one of my dear brothers in the faith said to me, in the millennial kingdom of God, when Jesus is king, we're going to teach everyone the law of God. And I wonder whether there was more avenue for conversation because I struggled to understand his position. In the kingdom of God, in the millennial kingdom of God, we are going to teach people the law of God. And I wanted to engage in that conversation, but it wasn't appropriate. But later on I thought, the law of God, as Paul so eloquently put it in Galatians 3.24, is designed to be our schoolmaster, our tutor, our guardian that brings us to Christ. My question also is, which is greater? The law or the lawgiver? Are we under the law or under Christ? Because we still, one of the things we do in the International Ministerial Congress is work for doctrinal unity. And we still have parts of the body of Christ, of the Church of God's Seventh Day, that's still very law-centric. And the judgmentalism that comes out of judging people by what they eat and what they drink. And it's very unhelpful. And it's a historic part of our journey that makes us appreciate all the more who we are. You see, the law, as Paul puts out in Scripture, is holy, just, it is just, and it's good. But the law can only sentence me to death because of my sins. The law sentenced me to death. God wants the law to be written into my heart as a part of my nature, not an external yardstick that has to hang over me. Conversely, it's Jesus Christ who gives me life. The law can't give me life. It just measures my standard of behaviour. It's Christ who draws us to himself. It's Christ who reconciles us to God. It's in Christ that we are distinct. And furthermore, all our hope rests on Christ alone. This is why we are a Christ-centred church, as opposed to being more law-centred, as my brother in another part of the body of Christ said, you know, we are to reflect the divine template of the mind and the body of Christ. Jesus, Paul said to those in Philippi, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. 
And the more people encounter us, the more they encounter the grace of Jesus Christ and more the invitation for them to taste and see that the Lord is good and be a part of the kingdom of God, enlarging in our society. I want to go back 2,000 years ago to this distinct but inclusive story in the story of Peter and Cornelius because in Peter's Jewish experience when he had to meet Cornelius and treat him as a brother Peter had a big problem with that. In the first century not long after Jesus ascended to heaven the Gentiles were beginning to receive the Holy Spirit and in some cases in documented cases they were receiving the Holy Spirit before they'd been baptized in immersion and water. So the apostles were catching up with that. God was visibly opening the floodgates of the kingdom of God after the victory that was gained through Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, said the resurrected Jesus. So all this authority was extending to people beyond the Jewish historical chosen model, regardless of race, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of gender, regardless of culture or language. Gentiles were being called to Christ and Cornelius and his family, and Cornelius was a man who made arms and prayed to God all the time, reflected this powerful universal working of the Holy Spirit. But the apostles still had to catch on. They didn't fully understand. Now Peter had experienced a Hebrew exclusiveness. And he had great difficulty in meeting and fellowshipping with Gentiles because Cornelius was of a different ethnicity, different culture, different background, wasn't of the chosen Hebrew people. But with God was calling him, it was clear. He already had the Holy Spirit. You see, in India we have the untouchable class of people. I'll share a burger with anybody, it doesn't bother me. But in India and other cultures you have people, classes of people. And in Hebrew times, Gentiles were regarded as unclean, and therefore is untouchable. If you study the cleanliness laws through Leviticus, if you touch the dead body, you were unclean till sundown. Some cleanliness laws meant that you were seven days excluded outside the camp for cleanliness. When the Black Plague went through Europe, because the Jews had such distinct cleanliness laws, the Jews were largely untouched by the Black Plague. So people looked at the Jews and said, oh, you've caused it. No, because they were so distinct in their cleanliness from the untouchable. But the question is, we get back to Peter and Cornelius, how would God change Peter's long-held traditions? Because sometimes you and I hold long-held traditions. Paul had to be blinded on the road to Damascus before he could see Jesus. What about Peter before he could embrace Cornelius? Peter was in, in prayer and he had a vision and he saw a great sheep come down from heaven, all kinds of unclean animals. And there was a voice from heaven saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. We read that in Acts 10. And Peter said, I've never eaten anything unclean. And the voice says from heaven, What God is cleansed, you must not call unclean. And many Christians say, Oh, see, we can eat pig and we can eat shellfish and we can eat anything. Notice that Peter didn't know what the meaning was about. It says that Peter wondered as to the meaning of the vision. It was shocked him. How could this voice from heaven tell him to eat unclean animals? Peter had never done that. He'd never seen Jesus do that. So, so the vision certainly wasn't about the animals, nor was it a vision about you can eat anything. It was an avenue for Peter so entrenched in Jew historic Judaism and its values to begin to understand that God was opening the doors that his, the man called Cornelius was not to be called unclean. He was his brother because of the Christ, because of the Holy Spirit. You know, up until that time, that was historically impossible. It was improbable. Remember Jesus at the well of the Samaritan woman? The point was made. How come he's, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman? For Jews and Samaritans have no dealings. There's that, that great social divide. And there was a social divide with Cornelius as well. What we see then with Peter and Cornelius is that the people of God, symbolised by Peter, who were entrusted with the oracles of God, and those who were considered lost, reconcile. God's Spirit drew two men together as opposites into shared fellowship, communion and covenant in the name of Jesus. That spoke to Peter's heart that day. 
because before the day was out, Peter and Cornelius were embracing publicly. It should really speak to our hearts today too, as we are called to reach out, as we are called to live distinctly, never to compromise the righteousness of Christ in us, but to baptise and share in fellowship with all those God is calling. As we wrap this up, let's jump into the future. At the end of the age, John was privileged on the Isle of Patmos to be given an extraordinary vision, another vision. Peter had a vision, now John has a vision. And John sees an innumerable multitude of people from every tribe, every language, as he learns all ethnicity, worshipping Jesus. Now John has a problem with that because he can't count them. John gives us 1260 days, 24 elders, 144,000 saints, whatever, all these figures. But when he comes to this crowd, it's innumerable and it's from every nation. And in the conversation in Revelation 7, we're seeing that these people, as the angel reveals, have been through great tribulation. They've been through great difficult times from every nation, every language, every tribe, and they're reconciled and redeemed in Christ. That's a powerful vision that I hold dear every time I talk about Jesus and nobody wants to listen. Because one day those words will come. Do those redeemed understand who Jesus Christ is? Yes, they do. Do they experience rest from their suffering and their labour? Yes, they do. Is the law of Christ and the word of God written on their hearts? Yes, it is. Do they know what Sabbath rest means? Of course they do. And so they sing for joy and are included in God's saving grace. The reconciling work where Jesus says, I will draw all men to myself. You and I are given a prime view from a prime seat into the panorama of human history and what God is doing. You and I never need to feel powerless. You and I never need to feel ill-equipped or incapable of moving forward with the work in God God has called us to. Because he who is in you, Christ, by the Holy Spirit, is greater than he who is in the world. In Christ we have victory. In Christ, his distinctiveness is our distinctiveness. His inclusiveness in drawing all men to himself is our inclusiveness as well, never with compromise. The purpose of the Lord is our purpose. His will is our will. And his words should be on our tongue and in our heart. Not only are we agents of reconciliation, living distinctly as first fruits and pioneers in this age, we are catalysts for the greatest story of inclusiveness as every, man, every knee will come to bow and know that Jesus is Lord. Because through Christ, the Father's having a family. We are now, as John says, children of God. My final comment in this, today we live distinctively and inclusively. In the new heaven and earth, we will live inclusively. Distinctiveness only applies for this age. Because one day there'll be one Lord, one faith, we'll all be one in Christ. Where's the distinction? As pioneers today living distinctively, that word may not exist in the future. May God strengthen us as we pioneer in faith, never growing tired, never growing weary, knowing that we are called out to be special in God, to do his work, to live distinctively and inclusive at the same time. May God bless and strengthen us for the journey ahead.